Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Daredevil Season 1, Episode 2, Cut Man, in our Daredevil rewatch series, The Road to Born Again. Jessica Clements and I are breaking down all 39 episodes of the three seasons of Netflix's Daredevil. Jess is out this week, but she will be back next week for Kingpin's arrival. This week, though, I'm going to be guiding you through a beat-by-beat -beat breakdown of the gnarliest hallway scene in superhero cinematic history. We open on a trail of blood in an alley leading to a dumpster while harsh fluorescent lights buzz and flicker. We talked last week how literally everything in Hell's Kitchen is dripping with the blood of the opening credits, and those blood stains are literalized here on the pavement. Blood even drips from the dumpster edge, meaning that Matt must have further injured himself upon getting into this. And those buzzing lights foreshadow the fluorescent bulbs in the hallway at the end of the episode. Matt is the cut man of the episode title, both in his physical cut condition and in the term's definition of boxing, because a cut man is the person who treats fighters' wounds between rounds so that they can continue the fight. Matt plays this role for his father, Jack, and Claire Temple plays that role for Matt. This is where we first meet Rosario Dawson's character Claire Temple, and she always brings a steady hand in these series that makes her a calming presence whenever she appears. And when Claire inspects Matt, there's an interesting effect where she shines a flashlight onto his eyes and his pupils do not dilate, tipping her off to the fact that he is blind. Now, according to Daredevil showrunner Stephen DeKnight, they toyed around with the idea of making her Night Nurse from the Marvel comics, but at the time, Marvel wasn't really sure if they would use that character in the future, so they changed her to Claire Temple, a more obscure character from the comics, and they did a sort of composite mashup with elements of the two characters. Matt stops Claire from dialing 911 just in time, which is crazy considering it really is just three numbers. He knows from listening what those numbers will be. And when nine and one begin, that means troubles are coming. Matt passes out and the fight commentary carries us into a flashback. Murdoch has dominated this fight, but now Price has turned the table on him as if the announcers were commenting on his KO. This is a rare instance of young Matt pre-blindness, making the image of his father's beaten face one of the few visual memories he carries with him. Jack says, Go get blood on your shirt. In the future, Matt's cut man, Claire, gets blood on her shirt. This whole neighborhood is dripping in blood. Interesting detail. I like how inside the medical kit is gauze, antiseptic, and a deck of playing cards. Cards are used by fighters to self-test for concussions, showing us how often Jack has gotten the hell beaten out of him. So Matt stitches up his dad, and the wound makeup effects look so real that we're gonna have to blur it because YouTube freaks out at realistic skin punctures. Uh, I mean, this is gonna be a fun series to cover, but Jack makes his son swig scotch, setting up this poor Irish Catholic to go round after round with Foggy at Josie's bar. Karen catches Foggy singing the Pirates of Penzance by Gilbert and Sullivan in the office. This is the opening number of Act 1 of the show, and it paints Foggy as a huge nerd and probable Aaron Sorkin fan, because Sorkin's always making characters sing <laughs> Gilbert and Sullivan in every goddamn show. You mean should be out having a life, doing poppers and flapper dancing. I don't know what kids do these days. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm Josh Lyman. So Matt wakes up and the camera pans from the couch, showing Claire sideways before writing the shot, leaving us, the viewer, just as disoriented as Matt is as he asks where he is, but really he is more worried that he is unmasked. Matt won't give her his name. All right, I'll call you Mike. Mike? Yeah, guy I used to date. Turns out he was very good at keeping secrets too. This is probably a nod to Mike Murdoch, who in the comics is the fake twin brother identity that Matt assumes. So Matt trans transitions from being regrettably maskless about his black covering to his youth being tortured by his eyes covered by white gauze. Here in this hospital room, he's flooded in green light. Whenever we saw Matt pre-accident, it seems like his world was lit normally, but anytime post-accident, like in his youth in these scenes and in his adulthood, the lighting designers go crazy because all Matt sees is a world on fire, vibrant stained glass, a surreal world where nothing makes sense. This kid suffers from sensory overload from his enhanced hearing where heartbeats are the dominant sounds. Somewhere it's probably Jen Walter's heartbeat that he's hearing. I know it, I know it. But Jack calms the son by letting him feel his face like in episode one. This is a bonding ritual between this father and son and now it's being used to calm down the cut man. Young Matt says, I can't see, which transitions to adult Matt gasping, I can't breathe. His own heartbeat must be deafening to him here. Claire helps Matt breathe, and he explains that the Russians kidnapped a boy. They've been running a human trafficking ring out of Hell's Kitchen. Took over when the Italians pulled it up. Now, if we are reaching to connect this to a possible parallel MCU history, these Russians could be affiliated with the tracksuit mafia, because one of the guys in that hallway he fights later is wearing tracksuit pants. And the Italians could refer to the Manfredi crime family, whom we saw in the 1940s in Agent Carter, and the same group who was foiled by Peter Parker in a deleted intro scene from Spider-Man Far From Home. Matt explains how the Russians took the kid to set a trap for him. Something 
something we never see. It's one of the rare violations of the show don't tell rule in screenwriting that actually works because this is character development for Matt and Claire and the episode ends with the ultimate no dialogue show don't tell anyway. Making that a fight that based on this exposition in this scene is technically a rematch. Matt has had such a long night. All of this is really the second half of his night. After for most of us it would totally be over. And Matt's steady breathing has allowed him to attune his listening. Someone in the building. A man going from door to door. How do you know that? He's on the third floor already. It smells like Prima cigarettes and discount cologne. Ah, by telling, not showing in this instance, the episode traps us within Claire's fearful point of view, so it makes the idea of this smelly killer somewhere in the building even creepier, like Anton Sugar in the motel in No Country for Old Men. And we flash back to Jack taking a beating in the practice ring, and the bell is so loud for young Matt, who still isn't totally used to his heightened senses. Matt is learning Braille. Each grew to six possible dots, so. Each letter is a combination of those dots. You have to feel for what's not there as much as what is. Yeah, Matt likens this with boxing, sensing where a punch could be going before it's thrown, but it's also a worldview that Matt will take with him. Like when his dad is not there, he must still feel for someone who's not there, or when a kid who should be safe in bed isn't there. Matt is the one who senses it. Roscoe and Silk drop in. Roscoe is Roscoe Sweeney, or the fixer from the comics known for fixing fights. Silk is a comics character of Sammy Silk Jr., who is a friend of Kingpin's son who actually organized an assassination attempt on Fisk and outed Daredevil's identity to the FBI, these two set up a match with Creel. Now, we saw Carl Crusher Creel in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. where he played the character The Absorbing Man, a guy whose skin takes on the property of anything he touches, and in the comics, he gets his power from Loki, and he later partners up and marries Titania, who we recently saw in She-Hulk. But this is the only episode of Daredevil where Creel gets mentioned. These two assholes say, You're young yet. Plenty of time to have more kids. What can I do for you, boys? And you know Matt totally heard this shitty comment from across the room in the background. We actually later cut to Matt's point of view at one point, proving this. And since they pressure Jack into taking the money for his son, Matt's father's death will be guilt that Matt carries with him for the rest of his life. So back in the present, Matt knows that the fake cop didn't buy Claire's story, so he pulls an American Psycho and... a brutal hit. I miss when Marvel superheroes could hurt people like this. And Matt can sense someone watching them, young and scared, meaning that Matt can listen to Santino's heartbeat and know how young he is and know how scared he is based off that. At Josie's bar, Foggy calls Matt. Climb off wherever you're on. Get down here. Yeah, Foggy assumes that Matt is getting laid, but he's actually in this moment probably on top of a corpse dragging him up to a roof. Because I know anytime I try to drag a couch up the stairs, I end up sitting on it. Pevet, pevet. Ah, oh, just nap time. So Karen talks about how she can't get the blood off her carpet, suffering from PTSD and the lighting of the scene casts both her and Foggy in red from the neon of Josie's sign, but it's like it's pulling them back into the bloody opening credits of Hell's Kitchen. But Foggy transforms that anxiety into something to set Karen's mind at ease. These guys are harmless. That's Tom Belkin. He's the road captain in the Kitchen Hellions. He organizes the food drive every Thanksgiving. That's Clint Peterson. He, okay. He is a criminal. <laughs> but he's turning it around. We are this close to getting his kids into St. Agnes daycare. St. Agnes Orphanage is where Matt goes after his dad dies. It's also where Aegis of Shields, Daisy Johnson, grows up. Matt strings up the Russian on the rooftop by a water tank, and Claire admits she helped him because at her hospital she's been hearing stories of a man in black mask saving people, so she felt compelled to help him. And Matt says, I know you're afraid. <laughs> you can't give in to the fear if you do. Men like this win. It's interesting that Matt discusses his moral reasoning behind his vigilantism right here, because either this rooftop or one similar to it is where Matt will be tied up in season two when he debates Frank Castle about where that ethical line really is. And today's video is sponsored by Babbel, one of the top learning language apps in the world. Babbel specializes in preparing you for real life encounters and situations. And new rock stars, we've been using Babbel for a while now, and it's great. Studies have shown that 15 hours of using Babbel is the equivalent of a semester of college Spanish. And 15 hours in Babbel flies by like nothing. You you can watch videos, listen to podcasts, play games, or do sessions. Whatever kind of learning mood you're in, Babbel's got something that fits the bill. You're learning, but it's gamified enough to be legit fun, too. I have daily goals and achievements I can unlock as I learn the language. At this point, I've been using Babbel long enough that I've leveled up from the hello, goodbye, please, and thank you stuff to the more interesting things like Siempre como demasi días palomitas de maíz cuando veo películas. Está bien, las palomitas de maíz son muy sabrosas. So get 60% off your subscription when you click the link in the description or scan the QR to start learning with Babbel today. The transition comes with young Matt reading this quote. There's a price to be paid for division and isolation. Democracy cannot flourish amid hate. Justice cannot take root amid rage. We must dissent from the indifference. 
We must descend from the apathy. We must descend from the fear. These are the words of Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, part of his 1992 Liberty Medical Acceptance speech, and clearly Matt took that message of dissenting from fear to heart. But what really is the price to be paid for isolation? Because this quote does, in a way, inspire Jack to go win the fight with Creel, something that he does out of desperation, out of machismo, and an unsolicited hero complex, which ends up leaving his son isolated. I think he took the wrong message away from Marshall's words. Jack shows off his new boxing uniform, which he describes to his son as red, really red, foreshadowing Matt's future choice of his own costume, and he says, The thing about red, hmm. I can't tell how much you're bleeding. Hey, who says I'm even gonna get hit? Or Murdoch's. I get hit a lot. Jack calls his bookie, telling him to put all the money on him to win by knockout, knowing it'll probably mean his death by the Mafia. And after making the call, notice how Jack leans back and an Italian flag is framed behind him, some of those Italian mafiosos whose world he's about to blow up. Jack then calls Matt's mother to look after him, saying, I know what I'm asking. Now, what exactly happened with Matt's mother is explored later in the series, but in the comics, Maggie Murdoch suffered from postpartum depression that turned into paranoia, and she actually tries to assault the baby, and she ends up leaving the family to go become a nun. So depending on where exactly Matt Maggie is in her life, again, Jack is not making the best choices for his son here. Drunk Foggy and drunk Karen walk the streets to kill some time. After what you told me, I'm never going home again. <laughs> Men are waiting in the dark corners of this oh. world to prey on us. As he says this, they pass under some red light, the bloody world of Hell's Kitchen saying, oh, go ahead, you joke wanna be Josh Lyman, but these few blocks of Midtown Manhattan with their failed UCB location are gonna mess you up. On the roof, Claire is now masked up in a shy guy look that looks even scarier than Matt does. She's clearly gotten over her reservations real fast and helps Matt torture the Russian. Try stabbing him to try jamming on nerve. Where is it? Going through here right above the eye. You want to go in right under there. How will I know when I find it? He'll tell you. And Matt brings the guy over to the edge and tells him, I need you to know why I'm hurting you. It's not just the boy. I'm doing this because I enjoy it. <laughs> this convinces the Russian that he is dealing with a psycho. And he spills the location of the kid under the Troika restaurant. And Matt actually drops this guy in the same dumpster he himself was found in in the beginning of the episode. Is he dead? He'll live. Yeah, this tells us that Matt wasn't entirely sure when that guy landed in the dumpster if he was gonna be okay. And as Matt slowly limps off to possible death, we cross dissolve into his father in the tunnel before his fight. When he goes through those doors, he's bathed in light because he is walking right into that afterlife by doing this. And we see this fight from Matt's point of view as he listens to it on the TV. No images, just the sounds. And after knocking out Creel in the fifth, Jack rushes back to the locker room for a quick getaway, but he cannot help but take in the crowd's chanting of his name. Sadly, these precious seconds probably help the mob catch up to him later in the alley. And like the ring of the bell in the gym earlier, now Matt jumps from the sound of the gunshot in the street below. And for one last time, Matt feels his dad's face. Ugh, heartbreaking. He switches from repeating dad to the more childlike and innocent daddy pleading with him. And now this is it. The most iconic scene of the whole series, a five and a half minute long take of Matt giving the business to the Russian traffickers in a hallway. Right now I'm speeding through the whole thing so you can see it in all its unbroken glorious entirety, but I'm gonna break it down here beat by beat because there is so much good attention to detail in the way this is directed. First off, remember, Matt is going into this fight already wrecked, several broken ribs, some lacerations that have only just started to been stitched up and a freaking collapsed lung. But this sequence begins by smartly giving us a geography of the hallway layout, where exactly the kid is, those Russians playing cards in the other room, everything Matt has to get through to get to this kid. A Russian brings the kid his meal, and we hear that kid crying for his daddy, just like we've been hearing Matt do this episode, and the f steals his apple. And Matt enters, arms at his sides, just as he told Father Lantum last episode how his dad would always enter the ring, arms at his sides. The cut man has crossed into the ropes. Yellow and green fluorescent light fills the space. And as Matt passes the first room, his head slightly cocks to the side as he registers everything he can hear about those inside. Matt swings over the door and goes to work. The door swings shut though, allowing the stunt double to swap in seamlessly. And the stunt fighter here is Chris Brewster, who also did stunts in Captain America Winter Soldier. We don't see what goes down at first, but the door breaks open when Matt throws a guy through it. That apple thief marches down the hallway and Matt, able to hear him approaching through all that fighting, times the throw of the microwave perfectly so that it hits the guy in the head. Think about it, Matt threw an appliance into an empty doorway, knowing that a guy's head would soon be there. Now, the camera glides past Matt and one with Think that they could conceal a cut here, but according to Chris Brewster, they did all of this in a true winner, shooting 12 takes of it. So they might have stitched together some different takes, but every take you saw, they did it all the way through, which you can totally see.
see in their physical exhaustion as they go. Which is why they choreograph a beat here where Matt is on the ground catching his breath and the Russians are regrouping too, and then Matt continues to fight through them. One of them actually comes back behind Matt, and Matt throws the gun at him, and the guy falls back and knocks the camera a bit. They keep it in because it proves how authentic this all is. It's a small number of Russians, but they keep getting back up, which is more realistic for a fight. They just keep getting more and more tired as they go. Matt could end it faster by using one of these guns to shoot them, but he doesn't because he is a non-lethal killer, at least he tries to be. But really, I think he just doesn't want a stray bullet to hit the kid. And as the fight continues, it's interesting how the knockdown door gives a strong diagonal element to the scene, a springboard for all these fighters to leap off of. And as the fight enters its final act, at one point Matt leaps from the wall to punch someone, and you can see he's just spent. He has to lean against the wall just to hold himself up. And so now the Russians are able to grab him and give him some solid hits. They take him back into the room, and again, we don't see into that room, but Matt comes back out and does an impressive acrobatic flip kick, and then punches a guy until his final hook throws him back into the room, where Stuntman Brewster swaps back out with Charlie Cox, who sells this exhaustion to finish the scene. And perhaps my favorite detail, before Matt goes in that kid's room, he raises his mask because he doesn't want to scare the kid. And he knows that for him, being able to sense his father's face was the only thing that could calm him down. And as he carries the kid out, he steps on the door, which after several minutes of several ripped dudes leaping off this thing, the door finally now breaks as Matt steps on it. Like as he walks away, you can see only now is it snapped in two. Our cut man has finally broken down the door of the crime of Hell's Kitchen. Ah, oh, yes, magnificent. Thank you so much for watching episode two of our Road to Born Again Daredevil rewatch series. Both Jessica and I will be back next week for episode three, Rabbit in a Snowstorm. Subscribe to our new channel, The Deep Dive, and watch my analysis of Christopher Nolan's Interstellar. And you can support our growing network by grabbing something from our merch store, nerdriot.shop. Subscribe to New Rockstars on YouTube and on all social platforms. You can follow me at EA Voss. And Jessica and I will see you next week. Bye, everybody.